Hello and welcome to IMC Licensing's webinar, All is Fair in Love and War, Brands vs. Private Label. I'm Molly Holskinek and I will be your moderator for today's webinar, which will be hosted by Todd Donaldson, IMC's Vice President of Sales. Todd will be joined today by panelist Rich Roman, President and Chief Executive Officer of Redman International, and Scott Etherington, Proprietor of Sales and Marketing Expertise and VP of Sales and Marketing at Hawk Foods. If you have any questions during the presentation, please send them via the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen and make sure Q&A group is selected in the two box. The host will try to answer all the questions in the allotted time at the end of the webinar. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to Todd to start our program. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, look forward to having this, this discussion about uh, something that's been on a lot of people's minds and, and appreciate all that have registered and joined us today. IMC Licensing, uh, from its inception through a period of strong focus on food and beverage and now an expertise in, in representing all types of CG, CPG products, has placed itself at, at an intersection of brands, manufacturers, and retailers, a place where we make great new products happen. During our, a recent roundtable discussion on innovation at, at last year's GMA conference, I, I was more than intrigued by some statements made by one large chain's private label director. <clears throat> Not only did he claim to do most of his product development to compete with other retailers as opposed to national brands, he also believed in a theoretical threshold for private label unit share in a successful store. That share would vary from chain to chain, format to format, but to tip the scales too far in one direction could be disastrous in today's fickle market. So yes, he really did tell me that stores need private label. Private label needs national brands, and national brands needs private label to completely form their identity. We agree that even though the gap between private label and brand is closing in terms on product quality and consumer perception, there are still voids in the product offering, though. Merchandising and development that can continue to grow their opportunities for private label manufacturers, brand owners, and subsequently retailers. However, today's retail climate calls for new breeds of suppliers to emerge. With retailers closing and consolidating, the ones surviving are calling for vendors to do more with less, offer more to choose from, to place in a few treasured spots on their shelves. No longer will doing one thing and doing it well guarantee success. Today we're going to look at uh, private label uh, and the ports of it in, in stores and in retailers and consumers' minds, the power of brand, and then how licensing can help fill the gaps in between these two types of products. Advocates of private label continue to hail the growth of their industry. Brand Week actually called 2009 the year of private label, with many other industry experts calling for 2010 to be more of the same. However, since the U.S. came out of the last recession, which actually coincides with the last big spurt in private label share growth, there has only been a slight gain in dollar share and negligible gain in unit share for private label. 2009 numbers uh, show a significant jump in dollar share in the first three quarters, with national brands rebounding in the fourth quarter. We'll take a quick look at how national brands have responded a little bit later in, in our discussion. But interestingly, what this pattern tells us, that it, it isn't as much that private label is gaining ground on national brands, but it's reeling them in, and their price is actually getting closer and closer to one another as, as we move and private label grows. The relationship between private label and national brands is on the surface very antagonistic. As private label share ebbs and flows across almost every category in the store, national brands feel the pinch. Whether it's loss of shelf space or loss of share, it all hurts. Some national brands will contend that private label is merely parasitic. Anything they can do, private label can do cheaper. Sure, successful innovation and flavor profiles are quickly assimilated by store brands. But with recent initiatives and speed to market, private label product offerings are now paving and testing the way for many national brands. Or should national brands view the relationship as symbiotic? With the majority share of the market under its belt, some retailers like Meyer dropping its private label line and baby food, and fewer and fewer companies producing baby food, does Gerber need to be emulated in order to maintain its identity? Scott, um, I want to call on you now to talk a little bit about uh, Williams Foods and what contract manufacturing has meant to it. Uh, from its inception with the launch of chili seasoning in, in 1937 to its recent sale uh, in 2008 to, to Gunther & Sons, 
Williams Food established a core competency producing a, a line of products for national companies. Talk to us a little bit about how uh, that started and how it's kind of led to, to other opportunities in private label and industrial for you. Williams Foods in, is an interesting company in the private label, industrial, and food service for about a third, a third, a third of the um, uh, total corporation. Uh, then when you get into the retail side of the business, uh, it, it balances there as well. Uh, we had our branded products, uh, Williams Foods, and then began to work into private label and then expanded further into uh, licensing. Um, there's three tiers of, of products and three tiers of pricing, and each one has its own uh, brand identity, and each one has its own place within uh, the retailer. No, it's, I think you and I have discussed before how opportunities in, in each of those areas actually led to opportunities in others that as you, you grew your retail business, you, you also found new opportunities to do you know, contract manufacturing for some clients and, and licensing led back to that as well. Is that Was that really true for Williams Foods? Yeah, uh, we would we would be in one customer, for example, and be doing uh, big business in uh, uh, branded products and then begin to, to work with their private label and then later expand into licensing. Or we might do it the other way where we would have a licensing product that enabled us to expand across the country. Williams is uh, strong in about five markets with the Williams brand, but as as we um, expanded into private label or industrial or food service, or for that matter into licensing, it expanded us across the country um, with the whole business system, uh, whether it be the broker network or the brands themselves, and then one would grow off of the other. Well, well, thanks for saying. We'll talk a little bit more about later about how some of those other aspects of the business uh, uh, were really important to Williams Foods altogether as well. In non-food channels um, or in department stores, we actually see a, a big difference in, in what we're, when we talk about private label and what it means. We see a lot more brand exclusive and owned brands by, by retailers. Um, Rich, talk to us a little bit about, I mean, what is it about the landscape of these stores that require this? Uh, as opposed to, you know, if we look in, in grocery chains and, and see the same brands, you know, store in and store out. We look at department stores and see so many exclusives. Well, they feel, and I, I have to, I can't disagree with them, that if they have powerful a, a powerful brand and they have the exclusive distribution of that brand, it gives them a leg up on their competition. That's the main reason for them doing it. The... Uh, you know, the, the old term of private label brand, uh, you know, what is a private label today? You know, they do have their own brands that they've developed and, and trademarked themselves. But uh, uh, an extension of that is the brands that are nationally known brands that they went out and signed with the brand itself, an exclusive deal, and uh, they market it exclusively. So in a, in a sense, it becomes, in essence, a private label for them because you can't go anywhere else to buy those products under uh, that brand. Well, I think perhaps you hit, you hit on a point there that it's uh, I'm I'm being a little bit too restricting calling it everything all these things just private label. It it, it does include uh, for the purposes of our discussion owned brands, um, you know, exclusively licensed brands could could really tie into into to private labeling as well. So it it's uh, going back to what started in an industry as, as generics and then became private label on the, kind of the uh, the food and grocery side has uh, transgressed or not trans I mean not transgressed but transformed into a uh, an owned brand scenario for a lot of these retailers that we that we're looking at here. Yeah, you have a good example uh, with this Dana Buckman brand for Coles. Now Dana Buckman had been part of the Liz Claiborne company and. Uh, they would, you know, design it, market it, try to sell it to as many customers that they, as they could. For whatever reasons, you know, things change, and uh, they've spun that off, and they've cut a, an exclusive deal with Kohl's. So, so Dana Buckman had been a, a national brand. I guess it would still be 
uh, perceived to be a national brand, but I think you only. You, but now the distribution is exclusively to Coles, so it's a de facto private label for Coles. And, and it's and thinking about Liz Claiborne and just and their uh, relationship with Lee and Fong. It's it's interesting to look at that. They've actually you know, sold a few brands to them. Lee and Fong being, being a uh, growing its business first as an exporter and, and then as a sourcing specialist that now owns some of the, the Liz Claiborne brands and, and have at their disposal not only some of the operations but also the assets of those brands themselves. Right. Their strategy is simple. They uh, they want to own these brands and they, they, they want to go directly to the uh, to the retailer and sign them up for a long-term uh, relationship. And uh, Lee and Fong will not be the ones who are developing or designing the product, the actual retailer will design the product within their creative areas, and then Lee and Fung acts as the resource to go and get it made and bring it in and handle the supply chain for them. And it, it, it's interesting and something we'll discuss later as, as um, we look at on, on the grocery side of, and, and food side of, the, of these businesses, are there things to be learned from the, the model on um, department stores as retailers on that side look to, to find more ways to distinguish themselves from from their competitors. Well, you, is that directed at me? No, I just it was just it was uh, uh there'll, there'll be a question for you later. Okay. <laughs> but it's uh you know, w w this is not all bad niche for brand because there truly is the, the, there still is a power of brand out there most recently as we look at uh, Walmart uh, even though it's still in, uh, pursuing some of this project impact that's, that it's announced, it, it recently has added back 300 of the products that it cleaned off its shelves as part of that initiative. Uh, they're not completely abandoning it, but uh, not far into the project have actually changed their minds, brought back products that, that customers they actually found were going to head somewhere else and buy, and they were losing entire you know, um, basket rings because of a few products they decided to take off the shelf. So it's interesting to see how that will play out. Yeah, that interesting. That is interesting. You know, I I knew for a while there that um, Coca Cola was going to take their brand out of Costco because they weren't at the price point they felt was uh, where they should be. And uh, I do see that Coca Cola is still back in is still now in Costco. I mean, you know, when you have a brand that's you know been around for a hundred years, it's probably going to be around for another hundred years. It's pretty hard for a retailer to live without it, in my opinion. But the, the landscape has, that it's created, it, it, brands uh, still can't do what they want to do. They, they have to respond, and private label or owned brands or store brands are, are, are truly our competitors, at least collectively, that, that they have to address. And we'll take a look at a couple of companies and, and how they've done it a little bit differently. Uh, perhaps the, the most ambitious value efforts have come from Kraft Foods. In addition to Oscar Mayer, Capri Sun, and Chips Ahoy campaigns, there have been value adds for box dinners like Kraft Macaroni and Cheese and even their premium Velveeta Shells and Cheese, both carrying the same save, share, and smile theme. And Kool-Aid, uh, battling not only private label in its mix category, has also taken on soda uh, from a price perspective and, and has easily been found at 10 for a dollar pricing with, with year-round advertising offering more smiles per gallon. And last year, Kraft conducted no fewer than a half dozen campaigns focused on the affordability of Kraft singles, which confronts considerable competition from private label cheese slices. And that really has been more of a positioning standpoint um, on you know, not changing the brand at all, but just saying you know, that the brand has more value. Uh, on the flip side of that, Procter & Gamble, um, instead of simply positioning it, its iconic brands as a strong value, has actually developed line extensions under the basic label. So instead of getting actually more for the same buck, you're getting less bang for, for less buck. And if you look at, you know, Charmin Basic, for example, you know, soft, strong, sensible, you know, practical, not pricey, big value, basic, clean for all, all of the, uh, the Charmin, Brawny, and, I mean, sorry, Charmin, Bounty, and Tide programs there. And it would be really curious to see that if consumers actually will uh, trade away from, private label and other price uh, competitive products or if they'll trade down from existing premium tie or tide or, or basic or some of the premium product and gamble products if they'll trade down from those for these and that's another one where only time will tell when we talk about the the power of brand um, 
one that's interest us, and I, I know that in, in my conversations with Rich has really interested him on, on what it's been able to do and, and transcend both uh, transgressions, I get to use that word now, of uh, the, the person that established it and, and continue to do so well in the market is, is Martha Stewart. Uh, Rich, tell us what is it for you that really impresses you or, or surprises you about this brand and what it's able to do? Well, it's a remarkable brand, and it's a real case study. It used to be that if you started in the mass merchant area, as Martha Stewart did with Kmart, you were relegated to that channel of distribution. Today, I guess the old rules don't apply because she actually had, as you know, ended her relationship with Kmart and began a new one with Macy's. And In fact, there was a period of about 18 months, two years that they coexisted, and that was never done before. It shows you the power that she has and the following that she has and, and how she relates directly to the consumer. And, you know, she goes now into, uh, you know, the Home Depots and the Pet Smarts and as well as the fashion area of Macy's. And uh, each one of those, they, they have uh, the Martha Stewart brand exclusively for their particular cate- category of product. So, in essence, it's, again, it's that fine line between private label and exclusive distribution. It is tr- cr- clearly a national brand with unbelievable recognition factor, terrific um, credibility with the consumer, tr- terrific following that uh, basically she could probably go anywhere she wanted at any time. I think she's beyond the uh, old uh, rules, and she, as you say, transcends uh, the various uh, channels of distribution. Well, it, it's only to be expected that uh, she would break rules. It's a matter of record that she likes to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, Scott, let's talk a little bit about, I mean, Williams Foods and, and the brands that, that they own. Um, and it's we have a, here are some just examples of some things that for the, the brand really started with its original chili seasoning. And that was a regional brand to start. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Williams was basically in Kansas and then expanded to the – five to seven state area over time and has a tremendous following in those areas. But it was only through the uh, acquisition of uh, Sunbird, which is found in all 50 states and all of North America for that matter, that allowed Williams to expand uh, with the um, business system and the supply chain uh, broker network to all the other states. And that then allowed uh, Williams to expand as well because of the Sunbird. Um, Williams is now found in about 31 states and has a tremendous market share now in 19 states. Uh, we then developed a product called Tradiciones, which is obviously what it is. It's a traditional Hispanic line of products. And we were easily uh, expanded into all 50 states because of the uh, distribution and the network we had established with Sunbird. And then that went to uh, further expansion because we already had the, again, the business system and the uh, the supply chain uh, in place and were able to expand uh, further into private label and then further into licensed brands. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Right. And it's uh, it, it's interesting to look at, it, and we're talking today uh, about this balance back to the, the original roundtable discussion that really led me down this path, that that it, there was a notion of retailers really needing to have a balance to, to be the most successful places. And as we look at companies like Kroger that, that has roughly a quarter of their sales, I think, come from their, their owned brands. So, you know, the, the, the largest retailer, Walmart, actually drops down to, I think, around 16, you know, 15 or 16 percent of their sales and something they're trying to increase, but still. It's a different balance for different stores and, and different success stories. I'm going to look at a, a couple um, of retailers, one being Target that really does a good job of that balance in terms of its own brand, some that it's developed, like Archer Farms and the recent Up and Up Market Pantry that, that mean different things in different areas of the store to some things they do exclusively with, with Isaac Mizrahi and Cynthia Rowley that um, really gives it, it that balance and creates a destination, you know, some of these exclusives, these owned brands. And, of course, it's a store you walk into and a huge, huge presence of national brands with their core products. 
Costco is one that takes a, a little bit of a different approach. Um, it's Kirkwood's signature brand, extremely strong brand, but in areas that um, maybe where the brand does not have uh, as much credibility as they'd want initially, they have worked with national brands to do some co-branding. Borghese and Cosmetics, uh, Starbucks Coffee and Coffee, that uh, will lift uh, Kirkland Signature up and actually is itself considered a premium brand, but an approach that is very, very interesting. And in some cases, not any of these yet, but in some cases, Costco actually will eventually drop uh, the national brand after it's built credibility for its Kirkland Signature line in those categories. You know, one thing that's interesting about Costco, if I could just interject for a second. Please do. They really brand their credit card because, uh, you know, you can only use an American Express card at Costco, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. Cash yeah. or an American Express card. Yeah, you know, it's really, it's, you know, it's one of those things that's and, you know, keeping the other cards out also keeps costs down. It, you know, it's, they don't have to pay back those those other fees. I'm not sure what the relationship they have with American Express, but I'm sure they don't pay them as much as other retailers do. I'm sure they don't. <laughs> But, you know, as we talk about the, as much uh, ground as owned brands and national brands cover, there are still gaps out there. There are still demands that, that aren't being met both from a consumer need and uh, from a retailer need. And one of the ways that we not only believe, but we know it, it, licensing is it, one of the ways to, to fill those gaps and do it successfully. And it's not a one-way street. It only succeeds where the needs of the licensee, the, the licensor, and the retailers intersect. And when that's done correctly, uh, we put together a great product that uh, that will um, really win over the minds and, and wallets of consumers. We have thrown ourselves in an intersection uh, like no other agency to, to get meet every possible partner here at IMC and identify a white space. Um, so it's one of the things we want to talk about here today, how it really works. And just quickly, uh, in advance of this recording, we actually had people contact us and ask us to cover a little bit just about the benefits of licensing itself. So we have some joining us that are um, new to the industry, so thank you for doing that. And so we'll quickly just talk about what the benefits are, and, and more of this information can be found at, at both our website and at Lima's website as well. It, it reinforces your brand. It supports brand awareness, in, um, just those occasions to interact with your core consumer in, in new ways. Uh, enhances the ownership of your category. So a number of reasons that a brand would want to do licensing. Builds the brand, improves the bottom line, and does some of the same things for, for a potential licensee. Uh, as Scott has talked about, you know, the um, addition of their brands and, and, um, and also doing uh, contract manufacturing, that they've built favor from retailers, which has led to more opportunities and introduction, which he's going to talk about in a little while, that as he's done contract manufacturing for companies, it's given him access to do some things under licensing for their brands. And the, Rich, as well, has talked about having that balance uh, gives them you know, more things to do for the retailer. And it, it's a, a great way to harness a brand, having access to the power of that brand, the affinity that consumers had for it. And in the end, these things, they're done right, and improves the, the licensee's bottom line. And retailers like this because surrounding a, a core product with um, other lifestyle aspects of it, with things that are, are close into it, uh, can, can build sales, can build basket rings. Rich, when we look at, at your portfolio, we see a number of national brands here, and you alluded to it earlier, what you know, each of these kind of means something different to both you and the retailers. Walk us through some of these and, and kind of just the differences, those and, and your long-time relationships with them, how it's really grown and, and developed your licensing portfolio. Well, you said the word earlier, lifestyle. You know, each brand really needs to have its own distinct lifestyle. Each brand needs to connect with that, the consumer's lifestyle. They're, you know, we're not all alike. We all have different tastes. There's regional differences throughout the, the country. And what we're trying to do is take what is basically a very similar product. I mean, it's very hard to differentiate sheets and comforters and, and accessories and decorative pillows. The way you differentiate it is through the lifestyle itself. And so in the case of, like, say, Marameco, which is a very clean, contemporary modern look, well, the best store we could sell it at was Crate and Barrel, and they, they, got, they, they typify that type of lifestyle, and we've had a, a relationship that's over 20 years with them now. We sell it to them exclusively. We own the license, but we do have this relationship with Crate and Barrel because it's the best place to distribute it. Um, 
you know, the active lifestyle, we have Columbia Sportswear. We do a lot of uh, warmth-type product like fleeces, and it's a performance brand. The uh, Tommy Hilfiger, which is our biggest brand, is, you know, it's an all-American designer and uh, younger, youthful, it's uh, it, it, traditional with a twist. And uh, Laura Ashley, very traditional, uh, maybe appealing more to the, to the older consumer, someone who has a very traditional uh, home. And so, uh, you know, Michael Kors, uh, kind of uh, glamorous, Hollywood, uh, a little more glitzy. Tommy Bahama, obviously we do great with it in the uh, southern tier of the United States. It's the island lifestyle. It's great in Florida, Southern California, Arizona. Um, you know, it, uh, and we have other brands as well. And uh, even when we do a private label, uh, where we, and we do a lot of development of private label that is truly a private label that is owned by the retailer, uh, we tend to try to de define that private label with a particular lifestyle of some type. Well, I know that that's one reason retailers approach you is because you're, you're, you know, it's not just your, your sourcing expertise, but the design talents you have in, internally at Revman. You know, it, it, these are things they, they they don't want to design themselves, but you you have built a group that understands what to do and what consumers like. Yeah, we're we're experts at it. We do a good job, and then of course we do support it. That we're, I guess, a mini uh, Lee and Fung with the except we do the actual designing and the development, and uh, we'll uh, you know go out and source it at the best possible place for that particular type of quality and and look. Well, well, thanks for sharing some of those insights. Uh, Scott, now it's your turn. It's um, Talk about some of these that uh, we alluded to earlier, that relationships with uh, with manufacturers led to opportunities for you and into licensing. Yes. Um, well, we had, uh, with many, many customers, we had uh, distribution with Williams, Sunbird, Traditiones, and other products. Uh, then we expanded... Either we were doing private label and that enabled us to further get branded products in, or we were doing branded and that enabled us to do some private label work. Um, but along the way, uh, we were approached by uh, some manufacturers. We were doing some industrial work, for example, for General Mills, and uh, had the opportunity to begin to work with their licensing department. And uh, they were looking for ways to expand beyond the categories that they were in. And since then, we've done initiatives with Betty Crocker, uh, Bisquick, Fiber One, and Green Giant. And that also allowed us to expand into the retailers. It, it allowed the licensee to expand within the retailers and gave the retailer themselves more choices for the consumer. And if the retailer, which they do, have a good balance with volume versus um, profitability, um, if that balance is correct, and I've had many retailers say it, uh, they really don't care if they're selling their own private label or if they're selling the licensed brand or if they're selling a true branded pro product because it all brings uh, uh, results to the bottom line. Um, others that we expanded into is we uh, capitalized on the power of NASCAR and we're, we've been able to expand into four major categories uh, utilizing NASCAR. Uh, we've also um, contracted with Sophia Loren to do some Sophia pasta sauces, which uh, has been a big success. And then uh, Jeff Foxworthy with some mixes and sauces and gravies. Um, then you have some others like uh, Bass Pro. Bass Pro was, as everybody knows, a big hard good company, but uh, they didn't see any reason why they couldn't be in the uh, food business, and so we developed a brand called uh, Uncle Bucks, which is exclusive to them, and uh, they sell it in canisters, and so we do that product uh, for uh, for Bass Pro, and that's been an added um, segment of their profitability now in the, in the food or food-related products. There's a lot of cross-pollination. Uh, with licensed brands where it gives people uh, the opportunity to expand their brands to places that uh, maybe they hadn't been before. primary example of that is uh, the Jimmy Dean uh, products. Jimmy Dean was, uh, and still is through Sara Lee, of course, 
um, mostly a meat company, but we were able to give them an expansion into dry grocery by doing uh, gravy mix, peppered gravy, and chili mix under the Jimmy Dean name, and it's been uh, very successful for us, for them, and for the retailer. And there's many other examples if you want to talk to them. That but it's, it's interesting. You, it's, you mentioned Bass Pro, and it, it's uh, they've done it on a very, very limited scale. But it's you, you actually see some of their products outside their doors. You know, we have retailers now at, behaving like CPG firms that are taking their brands and expanding them beyond, beyond even their own doors. Safeway for a couple of years now has been offering up the O Organics line uh, through a consortium, actually, of their private label suppliers that have grouped together and then working with. Uh, distributors like Crossmark have made o o Organics and Eating Right available to, to retailers that are not in competitive markets, and so it, that's you know that's extremely interesting. I, I think you know, Whole Foods has, has done things with 365 outside of their own doors or, or looking to. Yeah, one of the biggest that I've seen uh, in another life, I was in the yogurt business, and uh, of course you have the the Yo Plays, the Dannons, and the Palumbos out east, and Stonyfield Farms in the Midwest. Um, Safeway developed a brand called Lucerne, and the quality was so good and the product so good that they now sell Lucerne to other retailers in the Northwest. And 10 years ago, it was pretty much just in Washington and Oregon, but now you find it all throughout the West, the Lucerne brand, and it, at all different types of retailers, um, grocery and convenience stores everywhere out there. And that's a that's a Safeway brand, right? It's it's a wholly owned. It's actually one of the uh, members of of that um, Better Living Brands consortium that makes up the the group that distributes to and, and manufactures for the Yellow Organics and Eating Right line. So it's very interesting. You know, they have that wholly owned subsidiary there, and, and it, you know, it let them to operate sort of independently. It's um, anybody really is striving for that balance among things they do, capitalizing on what they're doing well, and because owned brands now on you know much like. Back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, owned brands and department stores that have are, are very complicated, complex, and have a lifestyle aspect to them. We're starting to see those types of brands emerge in, in the owned brand portfolios of, of grocery retailers and behave much more like a national brand. They're, they put marketing spend behind them. They, the packaging is, is um, you think back to what it's, uh, I have to look back at pictures, but when Jewel launched its no frills line, it was you know black and white packaging and you, you bought soda or you bought chips or you bought, you know, a, a number of other things, and, and um, you won't find that now. You, you go in and find products like Archer Farms that uh, really competes at a premium level. And we have these retailers striving for that balance. I want to quickly look at just a, a couple of other companies that um, really strive for that balance among brand and licensing uh, Brown Jordan is a company that for a number of years uh, manufactured just the most premium of outdoor patio furniture. And But as uh, outdoor living and, and those opportunities and, and people adapting to that lifestyle, Rich, you talk about Tommy Bahama, people like, you know, uh, that uh, whether they get to live a life of leisure or not, like to look like they do. But they, uh, they were, there were not opportunities for Brown Jordan to take its name down. It, it was not a mass brand. They did not want it to be a mass brand. So they, uh, capitalizing upon their manufacturing capabilities, started to do contract manufacturing for Walmart and Lowe's, and recently entered uh, into licensing arrangements to start, start do things that uh, other specialty retailers and have done extremely well with their Lazy Boy line, which they've taken outdoors. The Schwann's Food Company is somebody that, uh, I mean, uh, a, num <clears throat> a number of the leading pizza brands in Tony's and, and Red Baron does a lot of contract manufacturing. Recently sold off some of those operations, but uh, still continue to do some of that. And a very active licensing program with Wolfgang Puck. ConAgra Foods, who on one side of the business owns some of the largest brands in, in their categories. Surprisingly, really in, in the fruit snacks, is primarily a contract manufacturer. And they bring licensing into play in a, in a very different way. They actually working with the retailer will offer up, they'll secure the licenses for like Curious George, um, the peanut, <clears throat> excuse me, the Peanuts characters, and then co-brand those with the store's owned brand labels. And then an adventure group um, built their business uh, 
first with the acquisition of Poor Brothers, uh, intensely different potato chips, so uh, unique flavors. Um, in order to fill capacity, to do quite a bit of contract manufacturing. I've actually recently acquired a fruit business and do a lot of co-packing and, and, and frozen fruit. But also with its Fridays program, building upon the success of Fridays licensing and, and appetizers and some other areas, have a really interesting lineup of flavored salty snacks there, and I'm doing the same thing with Burger King as well. Well, we just talked about this balance uh, between, and it's uh, the reason I've invited Rich and Scott to be with us today is that they both have helped build companies that have this balance. And looking back to that initial discussion that I had at the, the Grocery Manufacturers Association with, with those folks there, that really was about retailers striving to find that balance that, that makes them competitive with, with other retailers, that it's always going to be a mix of national brands, uh, owned brands, which they can control, um, but there's a limit to that. And with there being a limit there and, and a limit to what national manufacturers and national marketers will do, there will always be gaps in between those. Uh, the ability to capitalize on brands that are, are growing uh, with the, the complexity that's growing in private label that um, retailers can, can go out and secure licenses directly as well and, and do a number of things. That licensing really does have an opportunity to, to fit into the mix that we're not in, in the near future or, or at any time going to see the, the death of national brands, uh, see private label overtake them, that it will always maintain this balance. We've got time for maybe just one question, and it's going to be difficult. We had so many good ones that came in. Uh, let's see. We'll talk. We, we, since we talked a little bit about this, we'll just touch on this one. This one comes in. How do you get licensors over the hurdle of committing their brands via license to just one retailer? Aren't they afraid it will alienate other retail partners for their core business? I'll start out just quickly by saying it. In, Certain categories, and we've already talked about it, especially in food and in grocery brands where these national brands, there is a reluctance and, and will remain a reluctance to do that. And I don't know how soon that they will start to look at categories that, that they might do this for, but we, we've seen exclusive, and it, it was not a, a major brand, but Walmart produces White Cloud. They actually own the brand in a couple of categories and I think do diapers with it and some others, but it's still the brand still exists uh, in a couple of other paper and, and non-woven categories as well. But it's um, this is a, something, a hurdle that a lot of brands that we see in department stores, Rich, as we talked about, have, have, I don't want to say have easily gotten over it, but they address it in, in a, a number of different ways. Well, I think the, uh, the licensor has to ask, ask itself uh, one big question. By giving a brand to, to one retailer, are you going to be able to sustain and maximize your business over a period of time. And if they can say uh, clearly yes, then it's not a bad uh, bad thing for uh, for them to do. Um, you know, because it used to be I would have a style under a brand, and I'd sell it to 25 different accounts. You know, and they they'd all share it, and you know we had to. Uh, we always had problems because one guy would lower the price, and then we get a cut telephone call complaining about it. You know, and so the market has changed so much that everybody, in essence, in in, a, in the fashion home business at least, pretty much has, I would say, you know, eighty-five percent of their assortment is fairly unique to themselves. So, if you have a brand uh, that can, that where the retailer could really get behind it and really support it with it, with its collateral advertising presentation in the store, and you're gonna you know be the only game in town, and, and it's a, it's a powerful enough brand that people are going to go to the store as a destination to shop that brand. Then I I think it's it's probably a good thing for the retail uh, for the licensor to do, and it's a, it's a win win for the for everyone, the consumer as well as the retailer. Well, I appreciate weighing in on that. Um, for all the other questions that came in, the, the folks will make sure and, and get out responses to you individually, but appreciate Rich and Scott, both of you joining us today to, to offer your insight and um, your, taking your wealth of expertise and applying it to some of the things we discussed today. And, and thanks to all those that have joined us via the, the webcast. Um, make sure and look forward to online soon, and uh, look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. Thank you.